Hello, everybody. Welcome to our open day. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, so uh, just to start things off, um, if you don't know, I'm Michael Pryor. Uh, <coughs> and we have Kavina for the Lucky Pryor and Sabrina Hurria. I don't know if you guys want to introduce yourselves first. Yes, we can start with some introductions. So how, hi, everyone. Super, super excited to have you with us today. Uh, it's a very special day for us because we're here to introduce our Masters of Science in Computational and Advanced Design, uh, which is actually the first run, uh, year that it's running. So we're very excited. Uh, thank you so much for your interest. And we're really uh, excited actually to even hear your thoughts and your questions towards the end. We'll start with a presentation uh, and uh, then like go through the program and, you know, like uh, we'll have like some amazing projects that uh, some of our students are going to share that from this first year. Uh, so there is going to be time towards the end of all this, like actually to ask questions. So as Mike said, I'm Pavlina Vardulaki Pryor. I am the creative director of the program. Uh, so that's why it's uh, uh, so special to me. I'm also uh, working at Nike. I'm the director for 3D Futur Design for Catalyst and also a PhD candidate at the University of Architectural Civil Engineering and Geodesy, uh, which is the university that accredits uh, this master's degree program alongside with uh, my colleague, Svetlina uh, Georgieva. Hi everyone again, uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, I hope that you will enjoy uh, the next couple of hours. Uh, as uh, Mike said uh, and uh, Pavlina, my name is Svetlina Georgieva. I am CEO and co-founder of Design Morphin. I am also a PhD candidate uh, like Pavlina in the same university. Um, we graduated as architects uh, with uh, her uh, in this same university in 2012. So that's uh, really short for me. <laughs> we can start with the presentation. Um, I'm Michael uh, Pryor, um, is <coughs> CDO of Design Morphine. Um, my role in the Masters is more as a kind of mentor or guide. Um, through the entire kind of series. And uh, I'm a computational designer at Nike and a procedural designer also for Wild World, Wilder World currently as well. So that's my my new add-on to my, my list of jobs. Um, yeah, so I uh, hope you have a really good time. A um, few things before we start. Um, <clears throat> if you have a question, um, you know, we're, we're trying to answer questions um, and we're definitely at the end going to have like a dedicated Q&A session uh, where if you want, you can even come on camera, etc. But if you have a question, I would suggest to ask it with the Q&A button. So if you see in your buttons, like all the Zoom buttons, there's a button that says Q&A. Um, this is just so it doesn't get lost in the chat, right? So like that will kind of stay there as a question and we can get to it when we can get to it. Um, so please use that, make use of that Q and A button. Um, and also a reminder, um, if you absolutely cannot stay for the entire duration, this whole thing is recorded and will be viewable um, afterwards from the same, um, same button on our website, right? Where you signed up, you'll afterwards be able to click the same button and watch the recording, okay? Um, so don't feel pressured if you absolutely can't stick around, but we highly suggest that you do. And uh, yeah, I'll give it over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. That was a good point. So we'll start with the presentation and uh, then we'll uh, follow up with uh, the next uh, explanations about the program. So um, Design Morphine's journey started uh, back in 2014 um, and through this creative platform, uh, we are able to connect with people, empower them and fuel uh, their passion for collaborative design. We had the privilege uh, to have taught thousands of uh, specialists from all over the world 
and nurtured uh, their progress in some um, of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, Design Morphine is a catalyst for collaboration with people uh, who we admire deeply as individuals and also professionals. The team is comprised of, thir uh, of 43 uh, talented architects and designers and a number of collaborating organizations, which gives us a multidisciplinary approach to design and its education across a gradient, gradient of applications. Uh, we are a community dedicated to academia, uh, but we are also all professionals who practice our craft daily, and this allows for versatility within the team. But also we are in a constant state of learning and bettering ourselves. Some statistics. Uh, we have taught students from over 82 countries. Uh, we traveled uh, in so many cities around the globe, like Dubai, London, Vienna, and many more. Uh, we created projects on many different topics, like robotics, virtual reality, um, and many more. Our pedagogy surpassed the teaching of uh, technical skills, uh, since we always challenge our students to give their best. First and foremost, we are a community. And as such, we support our students' dreams and we empower them. Many have been accepted uh, to universities like Harvard, the Architectural Association, SIR, or have been accepted to work at the Hagedit Architects, Foster and Partners, uh, Nike, Moonray, and many other reputable offices. Some past examples of our students work on multiple scales and topics like jewelry, architecture, installations. One thing always connects them and this is the experimentation and unique workflows. And as you may see, we are heavily invested not only in the virtual world, but also in fabrication. We also collaborate on product design with our partners. And one example that I'm sharing now with you is with the amazing Arturo Tedeschi. We created this uh, suspension lamp called Horizon, which encapsulates a freeform 3D printed shape within a handmade glass shelter manufactured in Morano, Italy. It was also exhibited during Venice Glass Week 2020. And if you are interested uh, to learn more, more about Design Morphine and our newest endeavors, uh, you, can, you can always check um, our social media channels and also our website. So today I'll start <laughs> with something that is uh, in the core of uh, Design Morphine, which is computational design and which is actually the application of computational strategies to the design process and it aims to enhance the process by encoding design decisions using a computer language. Um, so isn't the computer uh, actually using a computer for design, a computational design that one might ask and it's actually a great question and that's what we are here to answer today. Um, so basically, in the beginning of the profession of architecture and design, designers drew by hand and each stroke of the pencil was informed by the need of documentation. And as technology advanced, drafting boards and pencils were replaced by computers. However, the process of design and documentation remained exactly the same, only the medium changed. And that's how we arrived at something which is called CAD, which we all probably know, uh, it's a computer-aided design, uh, which is essentially uh, copies existing physical actions into the digital. Uh, so the computer is treated as an aid rather than a contributing part of the design process. Uh, this is a chart of the most used CAD commands uh, and which of those are mostly used together. And if we do all these commands and understand the repetitive processes uh, and uh, patterns of how we use them and how we can actually optimize the design workflow in a way that lets the power of a computer truly help the design process. And we arrive at the beginning of computational design thinking, which is defining the parameters and rules of design. 
Uh, but having the computer processor executed, design becomes a series of operations that can be adapted to multiple um, situations and conditions. Computational design is nothing else but actually a mindset. And a great example, it's actually this of Anthony Gaudi's La Sagrada Familia, uh, which is an ecosystem of geometry that emerges by the set of rules led by the structure of stability of the stone. The geometric, the geometric language was documented in manuals that were destroyed during the Spanish Civil War. And today, computational design is the key to restoring the original design intent since the building logic is encoded into the already existing structure of the church. A uh, contemporary uh, extreme case uh, that we could actually uh, look into is the uh, Sports Hall of Fame by Trahan Architects, where a computational structure system was defined and was able to adjust itself to changes in the architectural form. The rules of the system create the structure, the architect creates the form, and sometimes the computation will restrict the form so that, so that the structure can work. This helps prevent the designer from making mistakes as well as it frees up much uh, time from, from mundane tasks and lets the architect think more about the big picture gestures um, and actually <laughs> the design process. So computational design uh, can be applied to any design field, and that's what uh, it's exciting about it, not only to architecture. Uh, and here we can see a great example of Zaharit Architects and um, Stratasys developing a custom workflow uh, with repeated iterations between design and structural analysis. And it also utilizes material saving parameters developed by Altair Technologies. And in the video, we can see the program with parameters that they developed in order to allow the visualization of this chair and how it would look in different colors and with more perforations, etc. So it's quite an exciting way to think about design. It's very different from the conventional way of using a computer, right? And you can see here exactly like all the data that it's changing according to different parameters at uh, each time. And structural stability, which is running and it's very important part of uh, the design. So computational design enables you to automate the repetitive tasks as we saw that, lets you prove your design decisions with real data and forces you to think of design in terms of chunks of processes uh, that can be used in many conditions. And the best part uh, for me, it's so that computational design is multidisciplinary. It is multiscalar because it allows for this mindset to be applied across all industries of design. And that's what we see today. Uh, if, we, if we take a step further into the fusion of multiple software and hardware and use them unconventionally, that's where you find the most breathtaking and truly innovative design ideas. So we are excited to talk today about our, for, um, our actually like uh, first year of our fully accredited Master of Science in Computational and Advanced Design. And the program is spe uh, specifically crafted to be online. We aim to pre prepare the new generation of designers to thrive and drive progress in, and change in design, especially now when the fabric of all design industries is uh, reality is changing by the rapidly emerging new technologies. So computational design is actually uh, no longer just the profession of the future for all creatives, but it's relevant right now. And we see that uh, with leading companies hiring for computational and advanced designers uh, and creating these teams because they do see the value in that. The mindset and techniques and software taught in the program can be applied to any creative field, and that's the beauty of it. Uh, and this is uh, vital because it allows for this great versatility and diverse professional experiences. And this is the first year that we actually have uh, the program running. And um, it's really a privilege to be working with 38 incredible designers and architects from all corners of the world. Um, and uh, the distinctiveness of the program lies in some uh, of these 
key elements um, that uh, you know I'm going to mention actually, and uh, you basically get the unique opportunity of experiencing these different industries, as I mentioned, fashion, industrial design, architecture, urbanism, vehicle animation, robotics, all through the lens of computational design. It allows you for great flexibility because it is online uh, and it is crafted to be an online educational experience. Um, and as such, um, it uh, requires no additional expenses uh, like model making or uh, printing or 3D printing, uh, with the only exception of uh, the proto live where you will be creating your own swarm robots or robot pets. Uh, so we are actually um, applying um, our own accelerated pedagogical methods that allow students to absorb information efficiently. We've been working with Design Morphing for eight years now. So we are uh, actually, um, you know, like our, we actually thrive into teaching new software to people with zero experience. Uh, and it's been more than uh, basically 15 different softwares that we're actually teaching in the program successfully. And also, uh, new students will gain access to over 30 educators and mentors and real life, with real-life professional experience from the best companies and universities in the world. It's something uh, basically unprecedented for a Master of Science degree. Uh, and also, you know, our chapter presentations, we do include our community and uh, two months into the program, students have been receiving job offers uh, from eminent companies driving the future of design and receiving awards for the work from, uh, in the program. That's, you know, the first year that we're running and only two months uh, into that we see such success. But, um, most vital, of course, is design morph on morphing's disruptive nature uh, and this uh, fearless drive to build a united design community that will be part of uh, your growth as, uh, as designers uh, perpetually. So the program is uh, fully accredited and worldwide re recognized by uh, the University of um, Architectural, Civil Engineering and Geodesy and the university that, uh, as we mentioned, Svetlina and myself uh, uh, studied at uh, in Sofia and um, uh, we keep, uh, we're doing our PhDs right now. Uh, and the program is organized in a unique way. Uh, it's based on five leading design chapters and five supporting labs. Uh, they're technical and theoretical, and the whole program spans over nine months. The chapters are uh, five uh, weeks long, while the labs one week. And each chapter follows the following rhythm. Uh, we start with the first week where we have the theory lab. Uh, so students are formulating their own vision and they follow through the whole program as they're taking uh, charge of their own projects, uh, expressing their own voice. There is no right or wrong approach, but uh, you will be called to envision your own scenario and defend its relevance and value. Uh, moving into the next uh, week of um, the chapters, we have pre-recorded tutorials and one-to-one -one time with your core leads and um, uh, you're preparing for the design phase of um, the chapter, which is in weeks three and four. And during the leading design chapters phase, that's where students respond to their scenario and start with a generation of the enhanced human body. And then they progress into the development, uh, development of more complex architecture entities and build global systems and networks, reaching the final state of cosmogony throughout these chapters. And week four, it's where we have presentation preparation, where we invite again our partners and community, and it's a great way to gain exposure uh, and um, uh, to this community. So I will go through the chapters and give you an overview. And again, like, don't hesitate to ask any questions uh, like about any specifics that uh, you're interested to know. Chapter one, it's about prosthesis. Uh, so everything that humanity has designed so far is based on the way that our bodies are designed. And the prime focus here uh, revolves around this technological and cultural prosthesis since technology can and eventually will um, shape not only our minds, but our body also. So we start with a scenario-based approach and envision the fundamental element, the human body, and the technological future this body will operate within. We're looking into cyborgs, health machines, uh, health uh, um, and augmented beings. 
Uh, and um, actually, like the focus here as we start the program is actually polygonal modeling Maya and ZBrush. They're used in the animation industry, but they're actually used in foot, the footwear industry and also architecture at Zahadi, the Mata Architects and other uh, offices. So we have um, moving into the next chapter, uh, we're actually, uh, the scale is going up and we're working with what we call a core puzzle. So the core puzzle are the living conditions and spaces that the bond requires. And we work with uh, interior and exterior challenges. And we have to answer questions about the femerality, mobility, adaptability, transformability. And this chapter is focused on component-based uh, design and user interaction systems. And again, like we're moving now from polygons to uh, the interoperability of uh, Maya and ZBrush uh, through Rhino uh, with NERF subdivisions and also Grasshopper. Uh, it's a unique workflow, which is really empowering because it just gives you the ability to really make anything <laughs> you imagine. Um, in chapter three, which I actually we are going through with our uh, students of the first year right now, uh, which is a very, very exciting chapter where uh, we're looking into uh, what we call these living cells and uh, how they actually develop and create communities and clusters. So it's the very question of what constitutes a community of people. And we also examine how external conditions impact and shape these living and public spaces. We're looking into generation and optimization of rule-based uh, structures. And here, parametric design is the lead. Uh, parametric uh, design, generative design with Grasshopper. Uh, so we're really diving uh, deeper into um, the uh, computational design in this chapter. And uh, moving into chapter four, that's what uh, is kinesis. And um, as you can imagine from the name, uh, we're focusing here on vehicles and expand into various complex structures weaved together by transportation and mobility systems. So we're looking at uh, horizontal, vertical, uh, underground, organic growth-based systems. And now we're moving from Maya uh, and ZBrush uh, towards Houdini and particle simulations and flows, uh, which is something quite exciting because Houdini is really, really uh, taking over because of uh, all the abilities that the software has uh, dealing with very high complexity. So it's a great opportunity actually uh, to work with it in uh, chapter four. And uh, last, we have chapter five uh, and all these previous stages are leading up to this stage uh, in which we develop and access uh, the larger scale of our envisioned worlds the city. So by zooming out, uh, new challenges arise in terms of uh, increased complexity and encoding behavior will be the primary focus. So we're looking into C-sharp uh, agent-based growth algorithms with the grasshopper and programming also with Visual Studio. So we're really going into uh, creating these complexities that um, grasshopper is going to enable us to do. And as far as the labs are concerned, as I mentioned before, you are going to start each chapter with a theory lab. So it's an absolutely essential and essential vertebra of all leading chapters is the main focus uh, will, be uh, will be evolving with this theoretical frame across these three different axes. We'll be looking at symbiotic relationships of new bodies uh, with AI, emerging complexities of the new cosmos and ways to collaborate with and utilize patterns and behavior of the natural environment. And there is no predefined or given solution, uh, no predefined truth. And this deep lab is uh, basically a place of exploration. Uh, this axis of the theory development will be given, but uh, some uh, as some foundation to build upon. But the exploration of the structure and how it ties together will be up to the students. And we work with plethora of diversified materials like books, movies, anime, games, really TV shows, anything that actually inspires our generation um, and makes sense to you. Uh, we want to hear your voice. We want to actually empower you to be the best designers that you can. And uh, that's what the theory lab is here to do. 
the prototype lab uh, here the main focus is the uh, basically like going through uh, prototyping laser cutting 3d printing cnc milling and vacuum forming and the students are gaining an understanding of uh, these machines and uh, they learn how to prepare their digital models and optimize fabrication processes also they learn how to utilize visualization software like shape diver and other tools uh, that outline a novel production workflow the students will submit the, the visual uh, uh, visualized version so there is no real world model as an expectation uh, from from you and uh, we prepare the files for um, exhibitions basically or when needed and we print them so there is no expectation whatsoever about like actually creating um this uh, 3d printing these files since uh, the program is online the media lab again an amazing opportunity how we have um uh, vray actually coming in uh, teaching the first phase uh about like rendering with rhino grasshopper and maya and in phase two there is the post-production with photoshop uh, we will be creating unique styles of rendering with a personal touch and obviously attention to detail and um, we have also the robotics lab which i mentioned earlier uh, this is especially important to understand the kinesis part of uh, the master's program because uh, we're building here multifunctional small robots so what we call sw swarm robots and um, we're actually designing them by specific conditions and rules uh, so we use sensors of sound luminosity and movement uh, so we're dealing with aspects uh, as much as uh, material properties, geometry, structure, joinery, assembly, uh, programming sequence, etc. And uh, this is actually the only part that uh, you will be called to um, get the materials and Arduino in order to make your robot at home. And uh, actually, like, uh, you know, like, uh, it's a lot of fun actually making those. Uh, and moving into virtual reality, that's another amazing lab that we're looking forward to with the students. And uh, that's actually very relevant right now <laughs> with everything that's happening with the metaverse. Uh, so basically, it's how to shape these digital projects into an experience. This lab, um, the students will learn to utilize Unreal Engine and turn their projects into interactive uh, VR models. And this is... Um, uh, you know, like to make enticing animations, uh, to, de uh, to demonstrate uh, one's concept um, of, uh, like, uh, from the chapters. And um, this is basically like an overview from all chapters and labs, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, some of your questions later on. I'll give the word to Michael, and uh, we'll have also some of our students present some of uh, their projects soon. Yeah, so basically the students are going to be presenting, uh, we have five presentations and they're going to be presenting their chapter one and chapter two work. So that's like one of the questions that was asked about like, you know, like uh, how things actually are looking like and uh, you're going to see like that all the projects are super exciting, yeah, very different one from the other. Yeah, there's no projects that are even, that was another uh, comment we get a lot from our uh, the critics, the reviewers, they're always like amazed, like how every project is just so different. Um, there's not like a, a well, like same kind of project. Um, and again, this is just a, a selection of, you know, we have 20 different groups, so, um, and they're yeah. all amazing in their own right. So Aman and Anthony, I don't know if you want to turn on your cameras. And or... also uh, keep asking questions, anything that comes to mind, we'll answer them after all the presentations. And uh, if you have any specific questions to uh, any of the teams also, uh, please uh, feel free. Hi, Aman, hi, Anthony, super excited to see you. <laughs> super excited. Hello. Hey, guys. Hey, you I was trying to get my design more feedback on I could find it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay um you're you're the special one here with your yeah, yeah i got my curtains up and stuff like that. <laughs> so i just want to quickly ask like how are, how are you guys doing how, how are you guys feeling about the program just like short sentence or two i don't know just to start the discussion and move into your presentation 
Yeah. Um, I think uh, there's something uh, something you you went over was the idea of working full time, and although we, I think me and Aman we can say we both work full time, but it's just that this this uh, this program is so uh, avant garde. I'm gonna say because. I've never seen anything like it before, and I've done a lot of like different uh, courses online, and never seen something so organized and so like new and different. And you hit all the spots by saying you can go into any kind of new upcoming uh, industry right now, in terms of be it CG, parametric design, and all that. Uh, I think it's an amazing program, and whoever has like second thoughts, don't just jump right in and. Even if you have a job, just do it. You love doing it. So yeah, that's kind of how I feel personally. Yeah, I mean, I'm always saying like, you know, it's like nine months, right? Like it's not even, yeah, it's, exactly. over, it's, exactly. it's like over, it's over before you know it, you know, like, and it's just like a huge amount of doors you can open up in just like this short amount of time. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Aman, I don't know if you want to say something. Can I add? Um, yeah, so before I joined the masters, I knew only Grasshopper a bit, so I wasn't really comfortable with any softwares, and I was always thinking that will I be able to, you know, learn a lot of softwares and you know improve the the workflow that I have. But it's been like how many, like four to five months or six months maybe, and I'm like really really comfortable with every software now, like including ZBrush, Houdini. So I've developed this sort of a uh, workflow of my own so yeah i mean it's really really easy to learn with these guys they're like highly highly professionals over here so yeah i'm really thank really you. grateful for that <laughs> thank you for that um yeah if one of you wants to share i don't know how you you guys plan to do it um you should be able to actually, share actually I'll, I'll share and then we'll go through it through the sounds perfect uh, how much time did we say uh, we were doing uh each group Ten minutes. How much? Ten, Ten minutes. minutes per uh, project. Okay. Try to keep it around that. If you could. All right. <laughs> <Yeah>. oh. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's start. So again, uh, if anyone got it, my name is Anthony, and uh, Aman is my teammate, and. We would like to present to you today Codex Recreo, a revised manuscript. Uh, now, before I jump into uh, the different chapters, I want to like just go over what the whole idea behind Codex Recreo is. So, in the world we are living today, in, our species is in a constant state of consumption. Although we produce more than we consume, it is not a sustainable and self-sufficient process. So our suspicions have led us to conclude that there is a correlation with the process in which our species has, has evolved to the modern day human. This has inspired us to explore a new model of evolution and existence through computational design. The basis of this idea is to simulate a synergy between the classes of civilization that maximize the use of nature around them and thus evolve their realm into a better world with every cycle. Nothing is lost, yet it is reintroduced into this infinite loop around resources that are further developed at every iteration, advancing the entirety of humanity. Every connection in this chain has a purpose, eliminating the passive and bringing forth a regenerative system that forever grows into a better and more aware species. Can we rewrite, rewrite the Genesis cookbook? If so, what recipes do we need? That's kind of what our theory in, our theory in first chapter and this is kind of like a brain map of how we develop the evolutionary idea of the simulation. Now, jumping back into what Codex Recreo is. Codex Recreo is a, is a simulation of a parallel world. In this parallel world, instead of carbon, we have, we've, we have created something like, called a symbiote. This symbiote uh, pretty much spurs life to a civilization devised and evolves into four main classes. The first class is a forager, which tracks and collects resources. The second uh, uh, evolutionary phase is an agronomist, which grows and multiplies resources, which later evolves into an alchemist, which fuses and optimizes resources, and eventually turns into an ephemeral, which fabricates, assembles, and creates bigger structures. Now, it's important to note that this 
entire system is uh, when we reach the end of the ephemeral, we are uh, creating structures for the first foragers that come in to pick off where these ephemerals die and start all, all over. So for prosthesis and prosthesis specifically, we focused on the first two main classes, which was the forager and the agronomist. These main uh, first uh, preliminary classes of the civilization utilize mostly uh, the, lim the limbs and ex extremities of their body. So when we first started in this chapter, prosthesis, we first wanted to establish specific uh, traits with through models that better represent these uh, functionalities that these, uh, these humanoids would utilize. So we use tools like Maya, Houdini, ZBrush, a bit of C4D, some particle simulations here and there, just to, to, to kind of get a feel of how the symbiote aggregates around or propagates, better said, uh, along the body. So these are kind of like some tests and over here we have some uh, preliminary renders, just, you know, just test renders. We want to try out colors, tests and so on and so forth. So once we kind of established the system, we, uh, we, we kind of knew that, okay, this symbiote is kind of like uh, aggregating or propagating around from the extremities of the back and flowing down into the, the, uh, the limbs, uh, the further outer limbs of the, uh, of the human. So we later then developed a, a, gener a generation process of each of these classes. The first class, given that it's the forager, we started to, uh, to create these um, scanning devices and uh, started to test different uh, models and meshes around the body. And eventually we uh, kind of came up with uh, these specific different types and functionalities for every single part of the prosthesis itself in the forager specifically. So we have tracking sensors for the eyes to track for, for, for resources. We have a symbiote armor setup, uh, some detection sensors on the arms for scrubbing for resources. And then which on the back is a resource collection unit, a scan meter next to the, uh, uh, the left leg, camouflage extension, and specifically a preliminary capsule unit on the right for storing seeds at the later phases of evolution. I think now uh, Aman would, uh, will walk you further through uh, with the agronomist, which is the next uh, evolutionary phase of our human. All right, so I think we'll go a bit fast now. Um, so the next one, so, we come to the agronomist. So the forager, he basically fuses with something called as a growth catalyst to create another class, which is the agronomist. Now, as you know, the agronomist, his main function is the growth capsules, and he keeps on growing these capsules around on the body. And these are some of the generations that he evolves into. So he has three different generations. And the next one, uh, yeah. So in this, you can see a more exploded view of all the parts. Sorry, can you go to the next one? This one here? Yeah, this one, yeah. So in this one, you can see a exploded view of all the, oh, it, yeah, it's, yeah so, so these are basically the final renders which we have from the forager so you can see his uh, and each of the every and each and every generation he has a different ability which comes with it so for example in the forager the final form you have stuff like the scanning the collection and you have all the stats showing like how much can he do in his world and in the next um, and the next ones you can see the the agronomist forms so in level one he has growth and transform in level two he increases his uh, abilities as the prosthesis grows on his body and that's yeah and i think you can just show them the last one which is this one which is the final uh, this, this is it pretty much yeah, yeah this is the last one that we did so this is kind of the last phase where we got this in prosthesis and uh, i'm not sure how much more time we have but we're going to move on to corpus so let's see if we can uh, say say everything so in the next chapter we wanted to mainly uh, carry over corpuscle and show how corp the corpuscle itself evolves as well with the classes that, that further evolve in this world. So again, we are talking here about the symbiote going through every class and our corpuscle specifically happens in somewhat of a barren land, something similar to the early phases of the earth where cont continents started. Um, we, we start with the forager unit, which is where the forager starts to dig deep into the ground and then starts to create specific small capsules inside the, the, the 
under the ground. And then the agronomist uh, unit is an extension where he starts to build uh, growth and seed generation pots as a surf at the surface of the ground. Further later on, there's an alchemist which starts to build these roots or uh, the ephemeral which sprouts upwards. Uh, a, bit of, of a, uh, a bit about the process that we took. So we took a base geometry and we've volum volumetrized it with some tetrahedrals and Houdini. We uh, used some uh, basic propagation uh, rules to uh, introduce these capsules within the, embed them within the base mesh. Then we used the shortest path algorithm with uh, a bit of a handy tool cost called the cost attribute in Houdini, which was able to give us more precise results and these nice branching, which we like to uh, refer to as these tunnels that gave us really cool inter interconnected tunnels, which you'll see later in this sliced uh, images. So our corpuscle is kind of uh, divided into specific sections and each section is inspired by something within nature. So uh, as you can see in these, uh, these references. And this is kind of the uh, overall look and feel of the corpuscle. So basically our corpuscle is in constant motion. It, it starts from the, the surface of the ground, it goes underneath, and then it starts to surface again with the capsule pods, and then it blooms out as a flower. Uh, Aman, you can keep going from here. Yeah, I can, yeah, so this is basically just to show how the corpuscle syncs with the uh, environment where you have the first few stages, which is the forager and the hegronomist, they are basically they're basically um, underground. And as you know, as it evolves, it basically blooms up vertically into the other two classes. And if you go next, hmm. yeah. So this one um, sh is basically showing as a section cut from the plan view, showing how the spaces are arranged inside our corpuscle. And it shows you the linkage of the forager, which is all of, all the way at the bottom in purple, to how they link to the other classes in green, orange, and and uh, the last one right. is yellow. <laughs> and yeah, so next one, next slide. Yeah, yeah. it's not yeah. changing. No, yeah, it just changed. Sorry, yeah. Um, so uh, here on the left, you can see some of the sectional cuts that you can see inside the spaces, how the spaces are inside. And on the right, you can see some of the early initial visuals of how for the spaces of each class. So in the forager, you have these very organic sort of a field where in the agronomist, you have this sort of sort of a void which the capsule gets fitted in. And the last one, which is a ephemeral, is like more of a heavenly sort of a feel. And the next one, we just, yeah. So in this one, we were just preparing for the next chapter, which is the amalgamation, which is like just aggregation. So we were just thinking of very simple ways how to aggregate the entire corpuscle. And yeah, these were just some of the very, you know, initial ideas. And yeah, then here, here are more of the exterior, the views from the corpuscle and how it actually looks with the color theme. Um, next one. Some yeah, renders. The last one. Just yeah, some, some renders, the renders yeah. we, that we have. And this is mainly the yeah the final corpuscle from outside with the environment. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you so much for the for your your uh, presentation and a, a glimpse into your work. Um, <clears throat> You know, it's it's uh, amazing to me how much you guys did uh, in such short time, <laughs> especially like as Aman said, like starting with not really knowing much software. Um, and it's only two chapters in, right? You still have three chapters to go. So three labs to go. Um, yeah. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of exciting times ahead. <laughs> Now that you say it like that. <laughs> yeah, when you look back, it's like, it's crazy. And especially when you look at like the work in progress boards, they're just like, for me, the work in progress boards are the most fun to look at versus like the final boards. Cause I just love seeing like all like the pre-work and like seeing how it started and where it came from and like- all Yeah, exactly. Things. Especially in Corpuscle specifically, I remember we did a lot of tests that we just threw out of the window, but they took us so much time to do, but Eventually, they became something completely different. 
they're That's all relevant. Yeah, they, they all get you there, right? They're like a stepping stone, you know. Yeah. Um, that's basically four months worth of uh, work, which is incredible, really, guys. Like, well, not even four months because <laughs> that's really like two months, right? Because you also have the month of theory, and then there's like the whole the month of like the two labs that they did as well. Like, so there, no, th three labs. So um, yeah, it's been three labs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of crazy, you know. Um, I'll just I'll ask you a quick question uh, before we move on to the next group. Uh, um, for current CBs that wants to ask you guys, what was your previous experience in education? Uh, for me personally, in education? Yeah, like previous experience in education. Um, well, I studied uh, 3D interactive arts in London, in the design college. And then I actually specialized in character animation, which is something completely different. Mm -hmm. And then um, I started working in VFX, post-production. And yeah, I, came, I started getting into procedural design and compositing and VFX and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. But I realized that I've been using a lot of proceduralism with I got really in love with Houdini and C4D and that stuff. And that's mainly how what, what my background is. Yeah, for me, um, I came out from the architectural world. So I'm actually having a full time job in architecture. And at the moment, because of the masters, I got another job in a gaming uh, industry. So that's like so you're working two jobs and, and the masters. Yeah. Yeah. You're, one of, you're one of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And still feel we'll hold one so. of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So for all all of you asking if you can work and do it, uh, again, depend just depends on you. Yeah. So it's definitely possible. Um, okay. Thank you guys uh, so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to switch you back now to uh, attendees. Um, <clears throat> and bring the next ones up. Um, um, where is, where is Ava? There you are. Let me bring Ava up here. Okay. Well, Ava comes in, uh, Anastasia is asking, um, are the team, uh, consistent through the masters or the partners switched? Uh, your, your, your team is your team through the entire, entire thing. You, which is also nice too, because you kind of create this, this kind of, Hi. Hey, how are you doing Ava? It's going awesome with a wonderful <laughs> presentation. <laughs> yeah, so glad to have you here. Um, before you start and we just get into it, I'd like to ask you, I don't know, how, how are you feeling? Um, how are you doing? How are you feeling about this, this Super amazing. program? <laughs> I know you're, you're always having a lot of fun. In yeah, program, so. <laughs> I, I'm always hyper excited about it. And the best part is like, this program is more, I mean, uh, uh, structured well than I assumed before entering it. It was like very amazing for me to read those chapter heads, processes, corpuscle and everything. <laughs> and it came out really well and very interesting. It's going like a big bang uh, journey for me now. And the best part is like, I know what I'm doing and what I'm doing and why I'm doing because it's not just aesthetics we are focusing on. It's like the theory lab that is structured very well before the chapters and pushing our, uh, I mean, everything uh, yeah. that we design. So that, that's the best part. We are not just designing anything. It, it has a meaning and it has a purpose. So that, yeah. that's the and, very And you part. were actually just telling me how you're, you're um, excited because you're finally starting to feel comfortable with grasshopper yeah the one thing that i've been avoiding <laughs> all my life <laughs> grasshopper uh, so okay, I was really if you ask me grasshopper i jump to hoodie if you ask me then i just jump to zebra but there is an end to it and uh, the tutorials are laid very well so there is nothing yeah. to be afraid of and the tutors are always there for one-to-one -one help so nothing can you you can't be scared of any software after you just come through this experience i feel yeah. So I'm going to let you uh, share your screen and take your yeah, presentation. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, stop my video for a better audio because I have a lagging Wi-Fi right now. That's fine. And I'll, I'll just cut it back after the presentation. Sure. Perfect. Uh, 
sorry do i uh, share my screen or uh, yeah yeah just share your screen okay we see it okay uh hello everyone my name is ewa and i would like to introduce my project immersive and interactive mnemonics memories are very crucial for humanity and have shaped us and our environment since our birth till today so in our project we are imagining a world where we can not only extrapolate memories as data from human brain but also use that data as a pigment of art where everything is in a constant change the focus of this study is to apply new scientific ways and available technology to propose a different way of perceiving the world using machine learning and neural link uh, we are feeding the ai stored in our external brain building aesthetic inspiration from heart surface modeling incorporated with organic skin we started designing a central nervous system for processes our processes is named ram which stands for renting all memories it is based on the central nervous system of the body that reads all the different kinds of data and impulses that are shot by the neurons responding to different stimuli ram consists primarily two parts the external brain that collects the data from all the locations of the brain that are vital for human emotions and memories the second part is the external spinal cord that acts as a backup system for the external brain it also acts as a powerhouse of the entire system human body is layered and connected with different transport tubes that collect the neurons responding to various stimuli of memories on different parts of the body the external brain is a three layered structure that collects this data and processes for simulation the first part of the brain is an eeg channel headway that records this data coming from different parts of the body and for the sends to the secondary layer for processing this layer is the functional part of the brain that translates this reading to a generative script by artificial neural network the second part of the processes includes the spinal cord which is the stimulating structure that communicates cognition and simulation with each unique memory this process generates an immersive and interactive variation of what we call realities the external shell of the body covers the heart surface collecting the stimuli and sends for the further processing to the onion layer of the processes this processes has an onion layer within itself the secondary skin this skin is mapped upon the muscles on the torso which collects the muscle data all the data that's collected is proceeded and made into complex patterns as simulations these simulations will be controlled by the users by following such a process of design thinking and functionality we come up with this meta human that has a new layer within itself and an alternate reality as we say a corpuscle is named as bim which stands for a bionic immersive machine located in the futuristic landscape of tokyo just like the processes the corpuscle is constructed around the idea of data collection and juxtaposition of the memories we are given building a way to the conscious and use the consciousness to juxtapose its own memories and sync them with the cyborg at the external surface layer there are plethora of sensors which collect these data like temperature pollution along with the memories to allow for a smooth functionality of a residential unit the corpuscle is divided mainly into the three zones that are the lab area the zen area and the living area the lab area is the part where human can remove their external layer of processes and keep them in pods while also having the ability to tinker with them and increase the suit's capability this process this area also houses the vital systems for the module to function as this will act as the external brain for it and computes its data zen area zen area is the simulation area where the user can either spend their time with their families or alone this area will simulate all the memories of the users in that area along with its own 
The living area of the module has all the functionality of a normal housing unit as it also provides the users a personal space for their own simulations. The end goal of the corpuscle would be to aggregate with other modules and create a higher level of consciousness as it syncs the data which would result in the juxtaposition of the memories uh, by the time a colony of BIMS become a reality, which will begin to spark as the new reality in the perceived reality. So this is the final uh, output of the corpuscle and we further go for the aggregation and this is uh, from my end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Such a tremendous amount of work and, you know, we, we all, uh, appreciate it and um you know one of the one of the comments people always make about uh, Ava's work is how much detail is in it. it's just like very very fine details um <clears throat> even down i remember in the if i'm not mistaken in the process he has had like screws and bolts and kind of all these you know very very fine level details um so it's just really exciting to see you go into that you know that level of, of thinking and detail and the best part is like i i, I have not always been into this uh, background of details or hard surface parts like it was pushing my limits to something that even i was experiencing for the first time and with the, all all the help and every feedbacks that we got it just came out so well and I, I, like we are really proud of what we do here yeah i think i, th I think that's actually an important note for our, our degrees we we don't believe in this kind of like I don't want to say like these kind of like messy projects. We want the models uh, when this comes down to like meshes and the fact to to feel and be resolved and we get through it. We don't want you know these kind of messy things like you know, self intersections and these kind of jumbled messes and bad topologies. Um, so we we do focus a lot on that um, as well yes. as kind of like things can look insane but also be modeled well, right? They don't have to be modeled like junk, you know. Um, which is, I think you, you, you see a lot of this kind of like, it's very easy to hide things in rendering, right? Like, but uh, when it comes to like actually having to do things like, um, you know, in the last group uh, where Armand was saying he's working at now, like a game company, like you can't get away with that, right? Like you, things need to be resolved. Um, and that's something like in your models uh, and in their model too, like, right, it looks crazy, um, but if you actually, you know, we've seen the models. If you actually open these things and look them around, they're resolved uh, and nice uh, and figured out. So I think that's really important. And one of the things that you're putting a lot of focus on in this program is like how to really, I remember in the beginning, you know, like when, when uh, you guys first started just a little rough around the edges and we kept saying, like, we're fine, and come on, let's clean it, clean it, clean it, you know, like, let's make this a, a good, a good geometry <laughs> but that's what also like when you when you go right like uh, for any kind of interview like you send your portfolio in like any you know like uh, a specialist would see if the geometry is resolved or not and that's your first thing right like it takes time it takes dedication and actually that's craft right like that it's passed on and i think that that's what like uh, we're super excited to see ever like you're really taking it to the next level yeah, I still remember in the process chapter, I, I just designed a jaw just for the aesthetics without any meaning. And Pavlina kept pushing me. Why is that? I mean, you know, you have to have a why behind that and just refer to the MIT research and everything that <laughs> she kept pushing us. And we have answers to every why now. It's, that's, this so we is are a confident thing. for any interview you throw at us. <laughs> this is a this is a big thing in, in the program i'm always asking every time someone sees me why are you doing that why are you doing that it, it doesn't mean it's bad like when i ask that i'm not saying why are you doing that because it's bad i just really want i want to understand and i want students to understand why they're doing things or to at least even have a thought about it right like, so like that kind of why is a big thing in our program and and you'll get asked a lot from everyone why why did you decide to do that why are you doing that it's like you know um, and we're just really looking for answers and for you to to think about it you know rather than just do you know <laughs> um i think we should i just on. want to ask one question actually eva what was the biggest surprise for you coming into the program because you're in the first year right there were students before you 
<laughs> to ask any questions or to see any uh, any work like what was actually the the most exciting thing or thing that like you were actually like expecting to to see or to uh, I actually actually that that was my opening statement like i never expected it to be this structured and detailed the program as that, like it came with the expectation and with all the mentoring and tutoring one to one in that that is like something even if you are just walking by like a beginner with no background experience you can ace it like if you are very dedicated to it no matter you do a job or you are not doing a job but if you are dedicated to this program you can definitely nail it it was like this is com this comes from my experience and i'm uh, very happy to help if anyone has any questions about it and my experience or anything about it and if you have walked till here there is no going back <laughs> yeah so we we yeah i mean the the you know the, the the i think the important thing there is like we i think it's fair to say that we'll kind of always give you the time you need no matter yeah that, that's why i say that plans. you don't sleep <laughs> Yeah. Well, <laughs> with all, with all the help and everything, he even manages to pull off the free webinars and workshops. <laughs> we just discuss that he never sleeps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the joke okay. of Mike. <laughs> I was trying to figure out <laughs> when this gets late. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you guys. I won't take much more thank time. You so thank much. you. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um so Michelle's asking why don't we use Blender free, whatever, whatever. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have nothing against Blender. Of course, it's a powerful tool, but um, we're we're focused specifically on um, industry standard. Um, right now, Blender is still too too much. Um, how do you say? Um, I, I don't even know what the word I'm looking for. Like kind of like small studio or like freelance kind of uh, thing which is awesome for that um, but yeah i mean uh, again like we can't teach every single thing all the time and also like blender is like if you know a poly if you know how to polygon a model you can pretty much figure out how to polygon model in any software right so you know we can also say like why don't we teach cinema 4d right like that's probably bigger in the industry than than blender um but for us you know the, the biggest one and, and still is an industry standard in in most uh, vfx houses or, or even architecture is maya and uh, in that aspect um and rhino grasshopper so that's why we just we just focus on like the the bigger of the big but again that doesn't mean that the skills aren't applicable i mean <clears throat> even like actually a funny thing ayub who's who's uh doing the um what is this role called the core core lead uh, he's yeah. filling in this month as a core lead um he actually takes before we we knew him and this he was actually taking all of our cd next and webinars but following them in cinema 4d so he was doing everything we were doing but doing them in cinema 4d right so you know a lot of these things are interchangeable and there's just so much software out there so that's i mean that's really the only reason we don't do, use blender is it's just not the it's not the most relevant in terms of uh, career opportunity at the moment. That could change, uh, but as of right now, that's that's really just the reason why. <clears throat> um, you know, we want people to, to work in the industry, you know. Uh, okay, let me bring the, the, the next ones up here. Um, if you can raise your hands. Uh, yeah. Raise it again. Sorry, I accidentally picked lower hands. There we go. Uh, promote. Yeah, got it. Ooh. I can hear it. Hello. Hey, how are you guys doing? Hi. We're doing great. <laughs> Very excited <laughs> to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Um, yeah, before we start, I think I think it's a nice nice way to just get before we just jump into presentation. Uh, yeah, tell us how you're how you're doing and how do you feel about things. How are you feeling about the program so far? <clears throat> for me, um, the program is has really opened doors for me. I came from a construction background, so 
like uh, anything but computers, I think, because <laughs> I, I was always at the site. But uh, a lot of a, a lot of things changed for me during the program, and a lot of doors opened, and um, I was one of those who were able to get uh, a job in the gaming industry and uh, doing stuff in the NFTs. It's very applicable. The program is very applicable for many fields. Really. That's great to hear. Yeah, um, I guess for me, in simple words, it would be really like um, I get to really study and work with people that I look up to um, and, you know, people that you admire who are like the leads in the industry. So, I mean, the question would be like, why wouldn't you want to take this opportunity and, you know, start studying and start learning from these people um, who are really here to help you? So. Yeah, it's been really exciting. It's been an amazing journey, and it's still going. Yeah, I mean that's not, and not to mention all of our all of our educators, our our leads are all also in like major offices around around the, uh, you know, the world. And you have like me, you know, Nike. You have a lot of people from like Zaha, Big, and, you know, just a whole bunch coming. And you can look them all up on our on our website. You can actually just click the names, and you can see their profiles and about them and where they work and, um, but i'm sure a lot of you know them already because they're all like pretty known people kind of in this this in uh, this field of computational design so uh yeah i'm gonna let you guys get into it if you want to share your screen Okay, we can see it. Okay, so we'll start. The deterior extinction of plant and animal species, planetary instability. In 2099, would we even need another Earth? Ladies and gentlemen, speakers, admins, guests, and fellow students, we, Alib and Ali, proudly present Exuvius, the anthro cyborg metamorphosis, catalyst towards growth. In just 50 years, we would have managed to move ourselves out of the state that we were in in the past 10,000 years. We have now moved from the Holocene to the Anthropocene, where humans are the primary drivers of change. We are already approaching tipping points, threatening the planet's stability and triggering an irreversible decay. We begin by identifying the nine planetary boundaries as proposed by Johan Rockström, a Swedish resilience strategist, together with his team who developed a framework to identify the impact of human activity on our planet. Boundaries such as biosphere integrity, land system change, climate change, atmospheric aerosol loading, and biogeochemical flows are areas that we look at. As both human-driven and nature-driven disasters push these boundaries to planetary decay, we ask, could we reverse this decay? Is it possible to induce decay as a catalyst for growth? The purpose of this project is to explore the concept of anthro-cyborg metamorphosis as a core design principle that creates growth catalysts, targeting these critical areas and landscapes. The anthro-cyborg metamorphosis encompasses a harmony of anthro, meaning human, and cyborg being symbiotic with nature and machine, creating a molting cocoon that grows the user, the environment, and the succeeding levels of design. The metaphoric cocoon is embodied by a molting exoskeleton, which is a feature among invertebrates, arthropods, various insects, and crustaceans. Through the exoskeleton structure, function, and layers, design principles are created to revolve around two main objectives. First, the exoskeleton is a growing medium that stabilizes and recovers over time. Secondly, the, se the exoskeleton undergoes molting, wherein it decays into materials that are usable and upcyclable across all levels of organization. Through research of organic or of various technologies and organic bodies together with intelligent mach machine, it enters a state of symbiosis to, to form an exoskeleton. To induce molting, we introduce the principles, systems, and morphologies of the fungal kingdom, with vari varying fungal species that either decompose, enrich, sustain, or defend our ecosystem. With the ability of fungi to metabolize harmful substances, and generate fertile soil, we catalyze a single spore to convert a desolate land into an oasis of life. 
The exuvian concept featuring a molting and fungal catalysis influenced a wide array of material applications such as chitin and cellulose bioplastics, fuel and mycelium bodies and other organic composites. The concept has also influenced systems of expansion, growth algorithms, aggregation function, and operation syst operating systems such as this self-aggregating and growing system we have adopted for furniture. Looking at a broader perspective of our exuvian ecosystem, we have the prosthesis or the exuvian suit worn by the exuvian man, the corpuscle or the exuvian seed, the exuvian oasis seed, which is deployed from a kit housed in a rover called the exuvian scrambler pod, the amalgamation or amalgamation or the exuvian organism, the kinesis or the transport system consisting of the exuvian scrambler line and the cosmogony or the exuvian ecosystem. Initiating the hierarchy of our ecosystem. Enter the exuvian suit, where man marries both machine and nature, where the first growth seed is deployed in severely deteriorating biomes, where no one would go, where rehabilitation is of the highest priority. We first examine the growth cycle and formation of the exuvian suit where the first exuvian scout is deployed. We begin from growth attractors which are placed onto the major joints of the body. These will stimulate the growth parts of the exoskeleton to be formed, which gives rigidity and endurance. We then place machine components which tackle a variety of vital functions which support and enhance the scout's sustainability. The skeleton now grows on parts mapped by the attractors reinforced with fungal networks, adjusting through physical requirements computed from the different environments the scout would traverse. The outer shell, which is com composed of bioplastics and other biomaterials formed from molten insect exoskeletons and other organic materials, now sprouts. With it, the skin emanates with improved performance on every mode and on every environmental condition. May it be the scorching heat of the desert, the numbing cold of the Arctic, the crushing force of the high seas, or the hostilities of the deep jungle. Underneath the shell starts the growth formations within a substrate layer, which promotes raw material production for the organic systems of the entire suit. The Exuvian Scout is set to tackle tasks such as resource gathering, traversing through difficult terrains, establishing a central nucleus point, deployment and growth of the corpuscle unit, and decaying its components and materials for the growth of the immediate environment and surrounding units through molting, rinse and repeat until an entire cosmogony is formed. We have created an intricate and highly de detailed organic and machinic system, working in harmony with man to achieve growth from decay, from the attractors to the machine components, to the exoskeleton, to the skin, the shells and the substrate layer. Dissecting the suit, we look into the head, which leads the entire process as the central processing unit. Here we tackle communications, heightened visibility and connectivity. The upper torso, which stores and processes energy from the biosolar cell line skin. The lower torso, which stores and processes dehydrated and organic food, both synthetically and organically acquired. The upper leg area, which processes human waste for recycling on one module and gathered organic materials on the other. Both components bridging the loop between production, sustainability and recycling. The rear torso, which features the organic spine interconnected with the intricate loops of the exoskeleton. The modules contain compressed oxygen storage and processing on the upper side, and water filtration and storage on the lower. The hands, where growth is at the immediate bridge between the suit and the environment, adapting to terrain and sensitivity requirements on each excursion. Finally, the feet, at the immediate vessels to sense ground conditions. This area adapts to the immediate environment for mobility and traction. A deep dive into the inner workings and materiality of the suit. We see mycelium growth networks and other fungal species reinforcing both the skeletal and skin structure. The multifaceted shell structure composed of chitin and other organic materials forming a bioplastic composite. These growths are influenced by projected parts on top of the skin layer, providing a protective layer on each functional module embryo. Lastly, with these, the substrate layer forms an amniotic sac nurturing each and every embryo.
Moving on to the next in our hierarchy. <clears throat> we now introduce the Exuvian Oasis seed, which exemplifies the fungal growth system. This system features varying fungal species, which function as initiators for our ecosystem. With the ab ability of fungi to metabolize harmful substances and generate fertile soils, we catalyze a single spore to convert a desolate land into an oasis of life. We establish ground zero in a bushfire stricken cliff in Austra Australia's central region. Here, the exuvian man is deployed as a scout, traversing challenging terrain and inhospitable conditions. Here, he identifies and sets up the first nucleus of the exuvian rehabilitation. With his suit's molting ability, he can adapt to varying conditions and sustain himself. Enter the exuvian oasis seed, where architecture is grown, where fungus initiates change, where man marries machine, nature, and structure where the first growth seed is deployed in severely deteriorating biomes, where no one would go, where rehabilitation is of the highest priority. We first observe the deployment and expansion of the exuvian oasis seed by unraveling the exuvian scrambler pot. As the exuvian man breaks ground with a corpuscle kit carried inside the scrambler, he begins to place growth attractors. These stimulate growth facts, regulating enzymes and moisture. From this fungal network, and spaces inside are formed. After a few seeds are grown, the network expands to create more complex structures, adjusting to functional needs and forming a community of growth agents. The exuvian seed is composed of several layers of mycelium formations on organic substrate, packed by the exuvian man and produced on site. Reinforced with the synthetic interlocking granule aggregate and enclosed in a bioplastic film as former. The shells, which serve as a roof, are deprived, derived from the same materials as the exuvian suit, which is a hardened cellulose and chitin bioplastic. This raw material is abundant in insects, crustaceans, fungi, and other plants, which will be cultivated indoors. The exoskeleton, which frames the structure's openings, is of the same micro-material, only less dense, to allow flexure in the soft bioplastic glazing when subjected to harsh conditions. The zoning and interrelation of spaces ensures efficient circulation as the exuvian oasis seed not only acts as a habitat, but, but as a sustainable and resilient satellite laboratory, food production, material fabrication, and recycling facility as well. Spaces are grouped according to hierarchical lighting, ventilation, and humidity requirements. Areas such as the fungal cultivation needs low light, high moisture, and high heat environment. On contrary, the greenhouse would would be effective at high light exposure. The autonomy and sustainability system sports an energy produ production room storing solar power from the solar cell line roof. The water filtration system and sewage treatment plant recycle rainwater and used water. An internal moisture as high heat ad atmosphere rapidly dehydrates. The dehydrating effect is used to an advantage in food preservation and food production in, in the food production zone. The composting, greenhouse, and fungal cultivation ensure suit and structure building materials as well as food are always topped up. A closer look at the internal growth of the furniture and fixture starts with a foldable granule aggregate that self interlocks when activated and holds compressed substrate for mycelium growth. Paper molds are brought by the exuvian man to the site, which serve as formwork for both granules and substrate. After compacting the substrate, a cellulose and chitin sprayable film is applied to inhibit internal fungal growth. Finally, the other fungal species are added which serve as insulating and insulation and padding. With the system we have researched, we have designed the mycorrhizae furniture collection for Exuvius, which is reconfigurable, recyclable, and deployable from growth. Altogether, these intricate and organic forms influenced by the function weave graciously around the immediate topography, exhibiting an exemplar of peak architecture and nature symbiosis, working in sync to achieve a singular macro goal, growth from the game. As we close, we would like to leave you with a thought. In 2099, would you even need another Earth? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Awesome work. Uh, 
Yeah. Even that down to the details of like all the furniture and all that. It's just really, <laughs> it's really cool. I remember, I remember when I opened up the the mirror that day and saw this whole furniture collection. I was like, man, these what these guys are going crazy. Um, <laughs> and I don't, I can just tell that you guys are having a lot of fun. And I think that that's really important to me. It's not, not that you're just learning and, you know, doing, but also that you're kind of getting into it and having fun and having your own ideas about things is uh, really important for us. Um, I also want to note to everyone uh, watching and that will watch this, that uh, none of these groups knew each other beforehand. So that's really interesting to me as well, because I feel like you, you guys are all becoming like best friends. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just funny because like uh, just to not know someone and then just to get so involved with them in a project is kind of really unique experience, I think. We're like in a long distance relationship where you, <laughs> you do the sofas with each other with a video call and you know, uh, right, yeah, yeah. Just right, this is the right. And I think the program helps that with that. It really starts off with engaging us in a conversation where we really start to question very, very core ideas where we come from and th really get yeah. to know so that we delve deeper into these um, critical yeah. concepts. Yeah, I think, you know, actually, in, you know, in the, if you remember, it seems so long ago, but it wasn't so long ago. In like the first two days, we basically had every student present themselves, um, but not just their work, also like their cultural background, um, what kind of things they're into outside of design, um, you know, as a human, as a person, not as just like, these are the designs I made. Like, okay, we already know, you know, you've done some kind of design or you're interested in design. We've seen all the portfolios, but like, how can we get to know you, you know, better as a person, right? And like, these are also things that are important because it also helps to form these kind of groups and, you know, that and also like where people They're live. important information for the matchmaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly. But Lena is a very good matchmaker, I think. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I mean that's an important part of this this program as well. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. So yeah, it was it was a random, that's for sure. You guys like there was a lot of thought put into the groups and uh, really the passion and like the interest that you have. And uh, yeah, we're really glad like to see this uh, incredible work, but also exactly you forming actually you know, like friendships and, you know, there might be so many other opportunities for you even after the program to really <laughs> continue the collection. <laughs> oh, I'd also like to add, we have we have a lot of fun on, uh, on Teams and Miro, like, you know, putting, putting like memes and jokes and leaving little emojis and stuff around. I mean, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun, honestly. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good time. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. It's really like beautiful work. Uh, keep killing it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm going to send you guys back now. Okay. Next one's Nadia. I see your hand up, but it's not your turn yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Where's um, Sam? If you can also put your I see Alice here. There you go. All right. Nadia, Scott got too excited. We're excited for your project as well. <laughs> Hello. I don't know if we can hear you, Alice. Oh, really? Oh, no. Yeah, we can. We can. Okay. Yeah. Hi. How are you doing, Sam? Hey guys. Hey guys. Doing good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, how are, how are you guys feeling today on this this Saturday? Doing good. How are you feeling about the program? Yeah, I'm feeling really good. I think um, you know, I think it's just been like a really encouraging uh, and inspiring atmosphere to be a part of. 
um, I think from all, all angles, like seeing everyone grow um, as a, you know, as a class and then kind of getting all the encouragement from the professors um, has been really, uh, really inspiring. And for me, like my background is um, a little bit different than a lot of the other students. Like I have a material design background, so I was pretty intimidated at first to be joining, but you know, it's, it's working out and I'm still here, so. And, uh, I mean, Al really Alice it. is working uh, at Nike also as a material designer. Um, yeah. And it's just like, I think you didn't know any really, any 3D software before. No. And now you're just like, you're just killing it, right? Like, so it's, it's really cool to see to go from like you know material research and material design um yeah material when we're talking about material we're talking about like textiles and stuff like that um for like footwear and, and clothing uh to this is like really you know really interesting jump for you and uh yeah doing great how about you sam i will have to um agree with alice this is a, a very like inspirational experience especially because you have like, I mean, all your classmates that are from everywhere in the world. We have like a hundred different time zones and everyone is like creating all these interesting things and you get to see all that creativity put together. And at the same time, you have all these professors that are also like kind of like all over the world and kind of like constantly changing and you get to be exposed to so many different things uh at the same time that is i guess just a really like inspirational environment to be yeah i mean and that, <clears throat> i think that's an important thing to mention too is like um in our program nothing is hidden uh everything like you know as a student you can see what all other students are doing at all times right because of the, the way the mirror was set up right so um it, it's just it's nice to be in that environment right like it's not like you don't know what other people are doing or like everyone knows what everyone's doing all the time and you see you know you might pop on there at I don't know, some early hour in the morning and see some other students mouses moving around and maybe decide to have a chat with them or something you know so, um yeah so i'm gonna give it over to you if one of you wants to share and uh, share a screen Great, we see the screen and we'll let you get to it. Okay, great. Um, so hi, I'm Alice and this is my partner Sam and we're excited to walk you through our project uh, Endosim. So we seek to alter humanity's parasitic relationship with the world to a symbiotic one. And as we all know and experience very well right now, um, we currently live in a sterile environment where hand sanitizer has become our new friend and the ability to touch is becoming a thing of the past. Um, so this led Sam and I to sort of ask the question of how can you experience touch without touching? Um, and the truth is at all given times we're never touching anything and this is due to electromagnetic fields are the point of all interaction and our brains have evolved to receive these electrons and process them into what is known as our senses. Um, and this behavior can be exhibited in certain marine life that symbiotically utilize uh, magnotactic bacteria to engage with their environment and surroundings. Um, so this kind of led us to ask the question of, you know, how would humanity change if we could alter these electromagnetic fields? Um, so we explored this idea with our project Endosim, um, derived from the word endosymbiosis, being the symbiotic relationship of two organisms. Um, and so we, um, endosim is a, is a module spine structure containing magnetactic bacteria and various microorganisms that symbiotically enhance the electromagnetic field of the host and allow them to connect with their environment, um, creating essentially a natural Wi-Fi. So we, we implemented a few different types of bacteria. Here we have um, the magnetactic bacteria, which have the electromagnetic fields. We have cyanobacteria, um, that absorb carbon dioxide. We have um, the E. coli, which is naturally found um, in the human body. And then we have the biofilm, which is kind of a conglomeration of um, the bacteria that produce a film. And so this microbiome is hosted within a structure that mimics the human anatomy and is 3D printed 
with a combination of agar and microorganisms that have been fitted to the spine and will be the main center of interaction. And this structure will accommodate the individual throughout the human life. And Sam will guide you through this life cycle. So taking a closer look to our prosthesis, the idea was to generate an extrasensory organ with the help of these microorganisms, allowing us to perceive and interact with these electromagnetic fields around us, creating a closer relationship with our surroundings, others, and ourselves through this kind of a natural Wi-Fi of electromagnetic waves that are being constantly emitted or generated by everything surrounding us. Um, here in the first stage, you can see that we decided to locate these three printed models from agar in combination with the microorganisms uh, over the spine, because this is kind of the main point of traffic of the nervous system in the body, where all the electromagnetic pulses of the neurons around the body pass through, allowing the microorganisms to grow out from this point and directly connect in a symbiotic relationship with the human being. And as we continue going through the stages of life, we can see how it starts as human ages, the microorganisms grow with it slowly tightening kind of that relationship between the human and the organism as one entity instead of separate beings and developing that extra sense uh, to ultimately arrive to a complete fusion between the human and the microorganisms, as you can see here in the stage seven, where all the bacteria has grown to embody the human form as a second skin. However, as everything in nature has a start and an end, the cycle of life continues with the natural path of mortality towards a slow decay as we arrive to our final years of existence in the step eight and nine, where we arrive to the end of the human cycle at death, just to be completely consumed and transformed into nutrients for the bacteria to, to regrow and flourish starting again that cycle of life where ultimately at this point our project becomes more than just an investigation on how do you touch without touching and in a sense turns into a provocation i guess of two main truths that we constantly avoid first the mortality of our existence and secondly the unrealistic hypoallergenic world that we have created in which we think that we live in these sterile spaces when the reality is that we constantly interact with bacteria and other organisms surrounding us that live within us as well. Uh, so instead of trying to fighting them, we decided to embrace them, creating a new evolutive state on the humanity. So uh, essentially this symbiosis is not only achieved on the prosthesis level of human and microorganisms, but essentially all relationships will be transformed to symbiotic, as you can see here for the corpuscle. Um, the, the human made base structure and the organisms create the environment for the humans and all details down to the connection between units involve organic and inorganic life, as you will see, which will ultimately transcend to the entire environment. Um, and now we'll walk you through the design details and specifications for the corpuscle. Our corpuscle is basically a mixture of functions, a way to revive the dead environments that we have created in our concrete jungles and souls. We have created a combination of public spaces similar to the High Line in New York, and at the same time, an incubator of our bacteria that will clean the air and enhance the electromagnetic fields around us and our society. Um, and in our prosthesis, enhancing our senses and as part of the natural environment instead of our current state of isolation. As you can see in this image, the placement of our corpuscle will generate the growth of our bacteria merging with the surroundings and being influenced and perhaps enhanced by the conglomeration of people. Furthermore, once in aggregation, this will create kind of a maze of public spaces through the cities from which the growth can be extended to cover large areas and create that fusion between nature and the man-made structures. The bacteria, that we, the bacteria, as we saw previously, will grow around its surroundings, sharing its qualities, but as you can see in this image, it will also grow within the corpuscle itself, tightening the connections from one to another. The, the material that 
we have chosen work in a similar fashion to our prosthesis where the duality of the man-made materials, in this case, the concrete and the, a very resilient material is used as a base for the natural material, the bacteria to grow and rediscover the symbiotic relationship that we have lost. And looking to a closer uh, into interiors of our corpuscles, we can see that our whole program is focused on inviting the humans that interact with it to move, explore, wonder, and think. We incorporated a series of stationary spaces within a network of transitional spaces to invite people to gather and thus the growth of the bacteria will be enhanced in these zones. As you can see in the sections, the experience is created into different levels of enclosureness as well as heights, creating this kind of experience as you can see in the image where you have the interaction of the bacteria, the man-made structure, the human and its surroundings. Um, and the interior spaces are focused entirely on growing communal space um, in various ways. As you can see, there are communal dining spaces and work areas, um, all of which exist in the semi-outdoor environment um, in order to be a connection point between the dense city structures. Um, the bacteria is prevalent in the interior spaces as well and seamlessly connect the elements of the interiors together. Um, as you can see in our detail uh, shots, and here with our prosthesis existing inside. Uh, we landed on these structures by exploring patterns of growth in nature, similar to the way plants pollinate and grow, as well as lattice structures to host the growth using particle simulations and various grasshopper definitions reflective of these patterns. Similar to the prosthesis structure that served as a skeleton for the growth, the corpuscle will serve similarly in this manner. Um, and humans will create a symbiotic relationship by contributing and nurturing their corpuscle with the bacteria hosted on them. This relationship is echoed throughout endosim, with bacteria as the integral connection between all beings as we evolve to be compatible with our environment again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice and Sam. Thank you, guys. Yeah, uh, awesome project, uh, unique project. Um, can't wait to see what it happens with it in the next chapter. Um, as a kind of, you know, pun, pun intended, it just keeps kind of growing and growing, right? Like with your, <laughs> your bacteria. I mean, it's a really interesting project. I love the theory behind it um, and the process as well. Um, anything to add from you? Probably no more, Spiffy. No, I'm just super, super happy like to see you guys like exactly like having this unique voice and you know working so well together and like you're both from totally different backgrounds, right? And like you're working so well and uh, exactly like this theory lab was where all these ideas like came to life and now you're taking it from one level to another and I'm super excited to see what a world out of this uh, would be and uh, see the next chapters. Yeah. It's really unique approach, and uh, this is the interesting thing in uh, in our ma uh, in our masters that all the projects are so different with uh, unique approaches, and it's always yeah. so nice to to see them. Yeah, definitely. I, I like the aspect of the storytelling, you know, because it makes you really care about um, you know bringing something unique to your own project and. It makes you want to see where, like, how far you can push it. Uh, so it's exciting to to have so much connection with the work that you're doing and and seeing it come to life as opposed to like individual separate uh, courses. It's important to have a, a a goal and something to attach the skills to. Um, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning, otherwise you're just making a bunch of random shapes. You know, like uh, there's always kind of like the technical skills and then like problem you're trying to solve right so the theory kind of like invents that problem for you to kind of attack with these these skills you know in, in the workforce your problem is going to be your brief like what is the what is the, the project you're working on right so it's, it's always important uh, to kind of have something to, to focus on even when you're learning you know when i first started learning these things in grasshopper I, I actually didn't learn much from tutorials. Well, first of all, there wasn't many tutorials around when I started learning Grasshopper. Um, it was mostly through like 
trying to solve other people's problems on the forum like, like to, again like having having some problem to attach to and then trying to solve that problem it's like really the best way to force yourself to use the tools and, and learn them <laughs> Thank well, you. thank you so much. I have one so question much. actually that came to mind. Like, I just wanted to know how did um, this like theoretical framework and like all the conversation that you had from the beginning? Because I know there were some intense conversation, meaning like they have some. You had so many ideas. You were going into research, looking into bacteria, trying to actually like even grow them. So um, I'm interested and curious of like how did this like process went for you and how did it enable you to get excited about the work and then you know use these tools to actually manifest it and visualize it right yeah. well I, I think we really went through the rabbit hole as they say mm -hmm. uh, at the start we started trying to like basically get like the main point of humanity in itself we explore from philosophers niche uh, Camus, etc., all the way to quantum physics to try to like understand uh, what was what we wanted to like focus on and develop. And through the combination of both, I guess, is where we find out like the sense that you're never actually touching anything because in quantum mechanics, like because of molecules rebellion, they are always like uh, separating each other. So actually, you don't touch things. And then, like, that became like an, a really interesting idea for us the fact that like our reality is based or mostly constructed by the way we perceive it but it's not per se the way we know it and then at the same time we kind of have like that we'll call it kind of like sentimentalism of these like COVID times in which we are so separated and so isolated from one another uh, and we kind of like mixed the two of them and started wondering, well, what will happen if you were able to like actually interact with other people without like thinking that you're physically touching? And that's kind of like what uh, brought us to like this investigation of how a better world, hopefully a more connected and less isolated one uh, will work. Mm -hmm. That's nice. I think, and I think it was really nice opening with that theory because it really, I feel like we got to know each other super well through it, you know, we're like, we were just sharing so many articles and ideas and it was such a nice way to like kick off and get excited about the work that we we're doing. So it was um, really, uh, you know, a, a very like exciting and, and um, interesting investigation. So. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Yes. Great work Thank team. You send you back to the uh, attendees here. <laughs> Off we go. Yeah. Okay. Nadia and Pedro, they're ready. Their hands are up. <laughs> All right, let's bring them in here. Last presentation for the day. Excited to see it one more time. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me? Hi, guys. Yeah. Cool. Hi. Hi. Waiting, on, waiting on Nadia. I don't know what's happening there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's coming in. Takes a while yeah, we are sometimes. Disrupted <laughs> as always. We're <laughs> <laughs> so all jumping in line. <laughs> How are you two doing today? Um, and, and how are you feeling so far with the program and, and all that? Um, well, you know, um, what I discover in, in this master, at least from my perspective, it's that it's been really um, challenging for me in a way that um, I it let me confront myself with the things that I used to believe before the master and the vision that I have to the, digital, to, to the digital tools, basically. So what I learned here is basically that this kind of digital tools, digital tools that we are learning, we are learning has this potential to change the way you perceive the world. And that's something that I found that's fantastic about this program. And finally, I just want to add something that even though we are surrounded by uh, amazing tutors and mentors. I might say that I've learned a lot a lot too from my colleagues here, from my friends here. Because you know they are a lot they are professionals, 
they come from different uh, disciplines and industries. So um, that's another good point uh, to be in this in this program. I learned a lot of some of them. Sure. Yeah, yeah. that's true, Pedro. You have yeah. this passion about computational and advanced design even before coming to the program. Mm -hmm. But then yeah. I'm happy to hear exactly your perspective and how you're growing into it. Sure. From my perspective, um, I can say that I am um, very pragmatical compared to my philosophical, <laughs> philosophical teammate. And um, uh, I, when I first heard about uh, Design Morphine uh, Master Program, I was in my kind of career shift. I transitioned from design, uh, in interior design and architecture to industrial design world. And I thought that it's just, I follow um, Design Morphine must, uh, webinars for a long time. And I trust these guys like completely. And they say that if it will push my career, it will push my design vision to the next level. I trust <laughs> and I joined without uh, any second thought and just jump into it. And I'm really happy to be here because uh, yes, now I have um, cool friends. <laughs> I have... <laughs> I have a community, I have a, a amazing uh, tool palettes of different software that I've never used before, like Maya, Houdini and um, other stuff. And um, on top of that, I get my offer job of a company of the dream, <laughs> like I just all, all checkbox, you know, <laughs> everything I had in mind before I joined the Design Morphin Masters, for me, it's all checked out. <laughs> Thank you. Guys. I'm really happy you got the the, the job of your dream and look forward to your formal announcement of it probably through Instagram, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, super excited that you guys like have a, an amazing project. We're really looking forward to seeing it and asking you some more questions uh, after it. Yes. Uh, okay. So yeah, I'll let you uh, share screen and get to it. Sure, sure, sure. I will do it. Okay, so time to get fun. Yeah. Um, I'll also hello. like to remind the audience that that uh, Nadia and Pedro have a very fun presentation style, so enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, viewers. Uh, welcome to the Design Morphin News, the only future news in past tense. Today with you in the studio, Nadezhda Kutureva and Pedro Venegas Rodriguez. Hello. Uh, what we are talking about today, Pedro? Oh, how about mass extinction? Uh, did you hear? that the sixth mass extinction has already begun? Should we panic? Um, I'm not sure, but here with us, a design scientist who might have answered to how to save us all, Pedro Benegas. Let's hear to him. Yeah, it's me again. Split personality disorder, I guess. OK, but let's begin. I want to introduce you to the Autonomous Living Machine Algorithm Project, aka ALMA project, the first experiment for a collaboration between humans and AI. Just You just need to know that all is about data. ALMA project is about the use of enhanced creativity for the sake of mankind evolution, a blending between human brain and AI brain properties working together to create a unique type of agent. Three core attributes are explored in this process, communication, data exchangeability, and autonomy. These attributes will guide us in our journey through time, space, scale, even language. So we propose a model where invasive implants and non-invasive wearables work together, enhancing biological and synthetic senses to unleash a synesthetic experience of the host, creating the most valuable material ever, data. Data that is analyzed by Alma using the connective map as a knowledge library. Our goal is to create a cyber with biological languages and codes thinking primarily in some of the most prototypical codes of nature, like transparency, translucence, lighting, colors, even sounds. Let me introduce you to our first host of ALMA, Cusco, the astronaut, and Zoe, the choreographer, volunteers, of course. They collaborate with their ALMAs on a daily basis. For ALMA AI abilities, they enhance different senses and areas of their bodies. Here you see uh, how, despite the very same principles at the core, the ALMA intelligence in biotics looks very different. To go further, we need to go back to the backstage of the design. 
we wanted Alma to be friendly and approachable. And uh, we saw it as something living. And here is our aha moment. When we covered an organic looking item with a transparent soft shell, we saw our Alma. After that, we explore how Alma uh, could look like on all three uh, levels of physical digital blend idea. And at the end of our design exploration, we develop a visual style that we called Bio-Baroque. Different layers conform Alma, starting with main autonomous invasive implant, which is connected directly to the brain and the spinal cord, followed by the clothes or garments and sensors, which are those who collect data from their bio the environment. Then the wearable shells as the non-invasive extensions of Alma, like the brains with the limbs. And finally, the physical data and digital aura, those who are the manifestation of what we call the soul fingerprint. Let's have a closer look at our study subjects and see what kind of technology allow us to fabricate such design. Advances in multi-material 3D printing and data-driven material approach give us an opportunity to create personalized design based on characteristic of our heroes. As we push it further, we print with flexible bio-based materials uh, with integrated vascular-like structures. It gives us comfortable to wear soft robotic pieces with microfluids inside to exchange the data. To visualize this inner data flow, we use bioluminescence. There are all necessary colors in nature already. And by mixing them, Alma and Hans humans will be, able, will be able to communicate on a new level. In addition to that, Alma also works with sensors that read data from the electromagnetic spectrum, from ultra low frequencies like brain waves to ultra high ones like gamma radiation, and sending this raw data directly to the Alma main implant. Programmable materials technology is also proposed as the way for garments to work as big sensors changing their form depending on external agents. For example, in the case of the astronaut suit and its transformation while exposing it to gamma radiation, signaling higher danger levels. Concerning autonomy, ALMA as an autonomous agent doesn't require to be connected to the internet in order to learn or take decisions. Here, it's where the edge computing technology is proposed as a base model for individuality. But collective properties are also introduced. After human lifetime, all the knowledge gathered by Alme can be shared through a decentralized network to be read or downloaded by older agents, such as humans, artifacts, buildings, cities, or even planets. Here, it's where the blockchain technology kicks off with all its potential. And finally, the digital aura, as the highest level of communication, is the representation of a unique soul fingerprint. This is the language of the interaction between humans and AI, the language of Alma. And of course, much more things happen when humans interact with each other, things we don't know. Maybe that's what emergence is all about, isn't it? Now, imagine the interaction not only between humans, but buildings, cities, or even planets. This is what we are researching right now. So stay tuned for the end of this experiment. I hope this project will save us all from our doomsday. Una eternidad más tarde. Ladies, gentlemen, and Smith Mars, welcome to your new dream home, the Alma Corpuscle, where data is the key material for your happiness. If you have never heard about us before, let me introduce you to the story of our people, the humans. Not so long time ago, we, the earlings, overused our resources until we met climate crisis and mass extinction. To save the planet and our society, we enhance our biological brains with an AI synthetic brain, achieving new cognitive abilities for the unique creative agent who evolved to what we are now. We use central nervous system implants and only basic wearables that they gave us the ability to collect and analyze the data of the world, enhancing not only our physical limitations, but our cognitive abilities. And now you are about to take part on this experience. Thanks to our core attributes, communication, data exchangeability, and autonomy, you can be part of this new Alma society and experience it in all places, dimensions, and scales, from the individual to the collective level. 
So the Arma Core puzzle is set on low Earth orbit, a place that belongs to everyone, a place where you can experience technological advancements, you can access to the data of the world, you can do tourism and experience cognitive shift thanks to the overview effect. This Alma Core puzzle layout consists on the core sitting inside the womb that protects and sustains life, being protected and powered by the chrysalis shell and a virtual shell for data sharing purposes. So let's have a look at your new Alma Union living. Okay, enough dramatic pause. Let's continue. The best AI human artist has worked on this innovative design. They thought out every line of code of the algorithm that makes this project the most versatile unit ever designed. Algorithms such as differential growth, inflation simulation, structural analysis, optimization, and many more fused together with a bio-baroque style, very popular on Earth. So you can experience the solar system like never before from the inside out. You can live in this beautiful living part of the corpuscle, the womb, a self-sufficient unit that can be detached from the chrysalis from time to time and support life. You can even access here to the most valuable piece of tech ever designed, the data library, where all humankind knowledge is stored and shared. But you can also stay connected to the chrysalis through airlock systems. So the womb can be benefited by the energy banks, store areas, and material production that lays there. Did I say something about versatility? Of course, of course I did. The Alma units are fully customizable. Their design is based on dual personality, no matter who you are or what planet you come from. An astronaut on a mission or a sociopath from the dimension C-137? Our corpuscle units will shape shift to accommodate your lifetime and personality like never before. Let's have a close look at all features of your new home. First, exoskeleton. Our algorithms will produce a variety of structures and prepare the exoskeleton to withstand any gravitational needs. Next one, the inner volume. It's made from a durable and transparent composite material that will block harmful radiation. Inflated and pressurized interior will provide a comfortable space. Our state-of-the-art life support system will take care of the environment. It will timely replace old air with fresh, breathable gases, no matter what you breathe. The special light coding will show the current settings as beautiful interior decoration. As we mentioned previously, there are seven airlocks, main one from the womb to the chrysalis and up to six docking airlocks with eight possible rotation angles. Connect anywhere with anyone. On top of that, we have a digital layer for Alma communication. Your corpuscle can see and feel others in the settlements through digital aura and through the umbilical cord, all information gathered into the core. Connect to the core through the spot and exchange data with your habitat. Access the humanity knowledge library or add your knowledge to the collective. In the living part of the womb, you can find four platforms, recreation area, private quarter, food production, and the control deck. Recreation area is designed in a way to accommodate family reunion, reunions, parties, or just for you to enjoy. Diet of noise and people, in private quarter, you will find a microenvironment with adjusted light and temperature to give you the best relaxing experience. Fancy terrestrial food, but no time for planetary shopping? Grow your own food in the food laboratory from, from plants to meat. On the deck, you can control and adjust the ship system to your taste. And this, this is the jewel of the ship. The contemplation area is dedicated to overview the nearest planet and deep space. Behold the beauty of the life existence and appreciate the rare spark of life in the vast universe. Do you want to feel this experience? Order your living unit today. Call now. We accept Morphin Coins. Thank you. Thank you so much. Love the presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> just, a, just a disclaimer: there, there is no morphine coins, so don't. don't. <laughs> it's in the if, you, if someone has made a morphine coin crypto, it might be a scam because it's not from us. So, 
<laughs> yeah, don't. this is a good point. <laughs> Please don't go and buy some morphine coins because we, we don't certify. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much. That was uh, yeah, awesome as usual. All the teams today. Um, yeah, and um, just you know, just a reminder that I mean that's <clears throat> that's just five of what tw twenty groups. Um, all fantastic projects. Uh, but we can't sit here all day. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and all super unique and, and interesting. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if you have anything else to say. There is one question about software there. Um, just if oh, yeah, you want yeah. to know, if you want to know for our project, we for the first part, the first chapter, we use just Maya. And Keyshot for rendering, and for the second chapter, we and use. Oh, sorry, and ZBrush, sorry. And for the sec second chapter, we use again Maya and um, ZBrush, and we introduce Grahopper there. Um, but our render part was in Arnold. Yeah, oh, we yes, tried to, to use. I forgot to mention Arnold, right? Arnold and VRAN. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we try to use everything that software in the program um, offered us. We just literally try, try every render software we can <laughs> use here, and every software we just uh, play as much as we can here. <laughs> it's it's a it's a great environment for that. Just you know, experimentation. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll put you back. Thank you so much, guys. Awesome project. And I'm, I'm uh, saving up to buy my own unit now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank Amazing. you. Thank you. So that's, that was it for our presentations uh, portion. Um, and I believe we've given all the information I can think of. Um, I would just like to remind everyone uh, to please check out the website uh, if you haven't um, in detail, especially that Q&A section too. There's a lot of things answered there. Um, so I'm just going to, of course, just drop the link here. Um, definitely check out that Q&A portion. Reach out to us anytime. We're, we're always available. We do a lot of one-to-one -one Zooms, um, even a lot with our current students before they joined. Uh, we did it, and we've been doing it for the past um, few weeks now. Um, a lot of meeting with with you know potential new students interested. Um, so you can always reach out to us at masters at design working. I just sent it in. <laughs> Yes, right. And just request a one to one. Um, we're available. And it's the e it's really the easiest way to answer your questions rather than like text and back and forth. Like just jump in a Zoom call with us and you know we'll ask whatever you want and we'll you know answer answer your questions. Um so definitely do that. Definitely check out QA's. Uh, yeah. And so does does anyone if anyone has any more questions, uh, feel free to ask. Or if anyone wants to ask a question like on camera or something, you can raise your hand. I can, I can bring you up here if you want to go on camera or just voice if you don't feel like using your camera. Um, or feel free to type it. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have a join us, join us. Uh, it's a good time. And so we, we really care a lot about creating unique uh, designers with their own voice and who have a very strong skill set. Uh, that's kind of like the most important, I would say, for our for our program, is that you're comfortable um, with your own, you know, with your own styles and development. Um, John asked, I think someone said, machine learning. Uh, we don't have any machine learning in this program because that's kind of like, uh, to me, a bit outside of computational design. That's kind of like more into kind of AI. Um, so I mean, that's kind of like a whole other uh, field. And we've been thinking about that too. I mean, it could be interesting to have our, uh, another kind of program 
around that as well. But that's a bit, uh, you know, when, when you're actually in this, like as someone that's kind of in this question, it's a bit separated, um, even though there's maybe some overlaps, but it, it is definitely a, a different kind of field. So we don't, in this program, we don't have um, any machine learning. Um, and then the anonymous one there, uh, I don't know your name, um, but uh, for the first part of the question, uh, you're a current student at large university. Um, <clears throat> we'd love to help create a relationship between the schools. Um, feel free to email us uh, and let's, you know, if, you, if you're interested in that, let's get connected. Because uh, I don't, I, obviously, you don't have your name there, so I don't know who even to reach out to. So you know, just send us an email um, to like info at designworking.com. For the second part, uh, is it any way possible without an application to get access to lectures uh, and content? Uh, our lectures and content are strictly for, for this or for the students. Um, however, we do have two students now taking the program without uh, getting a degree um, because I think they didn't qualify for a degree, but they didn't want a degree anyway. They just wanted to be part of the program, but they're still fully part of the program like any other student. So there's not like a, it's not like a shortcut or something, right? Like they're doing the same work in the same teams. They're enjoying it just as much. The only difference is that they're they're not getting a, a credit degree at the end, um, but they, they weren't actually necessarily interested in that. They just wanted you know, they didn't qualify, but they, they wanted to be part of this this program. And uh, yeah, they're doing awesome as well. So, Well, yeah, and the whole idea also is that we are giving, we are recommending you actually like to our uh, co community, um, even as you see before graduation. So that's why for us, the quality of the work matters a lot. So it's not about uh just you know taking some courses and you know like just chilling and watching some tutorials and it doesn't really you know matter how much you really took from it here it does matter because you are receiving a master of science degree which is recognized worldwide you can you know like go into academia with a phd you can continue to another master's you can open your own office you can you know go to work somewhere else but also uh, design morphing uh, throughout the last eight years has become a, quite a strong name in the computational design industry and uh, it matters to us that you know like if you are part of this program that you are actually you know like competent you're actually a really strong designer because it actually helps you also navigate and be part of this community so we want to be actually proud of you and we want to you know cr create opportunities for you and for you to actually like be the strongest designer that you could. And that's why we're so involved. And to be honest, I've been, <laughs> I've been uh, around a few uh, education, uh, educational institutions. And I can say that I haven't seen a master's degree that it's so involved, right? The whole community, all the educators, the core leads, like uh, mentors, they're like so passionate about like, you know, the program and what we do and we care so deeply. And you can see that even with the projects of the students, right? Like this is two out of five chapters uh, work, uh, right? Like they're, they're not even in the middle of, of their, you know, like a uh, journey and they're killing it. And so many of them hadn't even touched, you know, like software, uh, this kind of softwares before had uh, experiences like that. So that's why for us, really, this matters a lot because we want to see you guys really killing it out there. And that's the way. So uh, Henry is asking, what kind of work or portfolio are you looking for to get scholarships? <laughs> Good one. Well, I would say that like it needs to be something, right? Like representing your own voice uh, and your own perspective. Because at the end of the day, design is very uh, personal experience. Like it's not something that you could just, um, you know, like uh, copy from somewhere else. So this unique voice that like we're, we're looking for you to represent like as part of the program, uh, like we want to see it in your portfolio. Software wise, I would say that like um, 
you know, where obviously we understand that everyone is coming from a different background, but the creativity part is something that like we're looking into and the, the care and love that you have for your projects, right? And also the personal statement that you're writing, that it's very short, it's just one, uh, one paragraph, but it needs to be to the point, right? Like expressing your interest, your background, and, you know, like your motivation for being part of this. Yeah. Even last year, we had like a tremendous amount of interest, like right, and we had like only like forty of these students actually making it even to the program. Not just uh, you know like one part of the scholarships. Obviously, only really um, people with uh, experience and like amazing uh, portfolios. Like they were awarded the scholarships, but also like even being part of that. It's actually something, and that's why I always recommend for you to put in your application as soon as possible because it is, um, you know, like uh, as applications are coming in, we're reviewing them, we're, they're going through uh, processes with the university, so it takes uh, some time. So I would encourage everyone who is interested really to, uh, you know, like apply and definitely before the 15th of February deadline, because that's the deadline for the scholarships too. So your application will count towards reviewing the documentation, but also just adding a link to a portfolio. It's actually giving you the chance of, you know, being considered for a scholarship. 